All right, let's start. My name is Sun Peng. I am a faculty member in the Fuqua Decision Sciences area. Today, I'm going to talk about information design in controlling infections. Fuqua faculty are coming to you live on LinkedIn the first and third Wednesday of each month at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you for joining today's session with me. If you have any questions during the session, please leave them in the comments section. If you are alumnus or a current student in the audience, you may have taken the decision models course from either me or some of my colleagues. So you know that mathematical models can be a powerful tool to help us make better decisions and gain a deeper understanding of the world around us. Today, I will talk about some modeling work in controlling epidemics. I suspect that before the current pandemic, many people think that disease control is a purely medical problem. The current situation shows that there are many social and managerial issues in this problem as well. People's incentives and decisions affect the progression of infection and the effectiveness of intervention measures. In this work, my co-authors and I try to better understand information design issues in controlling infectious disease. It's worth acknowledging my co-authors on this work. Uh, one is my colleague, uh, Ali Makdumi, also a Fuqua Decision Sciences faculty member. Uh, the other is Chang Min Jun, a Decision Sciences PhD student. All right, so first of all, what is information design? This concept was developed in recent years in the economics literature. It studies how a decision maker with more information conveys the information so as to induce desirable behaviors from information receivers. In our setting, we can imagine that uh, the information receivers are people in a community. Right? So the information sender is some, say, public authority or healthcare professional. And let me be perfectly clear up, up front that we're not talking about distorting information or lying. Even though we live in an age with much misinformation, and it's, it's certainly important to better understand and deal with that phenomenon, information design that we are talking about here is not about misinformation. The foundation of studying rational decision making is based on the assumption that decision makers are not detached from reality. Under this assumption, lies cannot live long. So information design is about how to tell truth. And the key question is whether to tell the whole truth. It may sound controversial to some of you that telling the truth but not the whole truth deserves studying. Don't we always hope that our government and people in power to always be transparent and tell us everything? Well, let us actually put these general principles aside for a little bit and evaluate the potential impact of telling the truth but not necessarily the whole truth. From a societal point of view, is it ever better to convey noisy information? And if so, how should one do it? Well, to better understand the trade-offs and logics here, let us first consider a model of infection. Disease transmission in the community can be thought of as forming a network. Think about the community as, say, a town or a university. Each one of us in this community is a node on this potential network. If one infected node passes the disease to another node, we add an arc between these two nodes. Nodes are not the same. Uh, some nodes have a higher chance of connecting to other nodes. This represents people who have higher social activity levels. The chance of an arc forming between the two nodes depends on the social activity levels of these two people, as well as the trans transmissibility of the disease. So we can actually look at the slide. Let me make sure that um, the slide is, is appearing on, the, on your screen, okay? So here, the slide gives us a way to compute the chance of an arc forming between node I and J. So here, Xi is the, the social activity level of node I, Xj is the social activity level of, XJ, of node J, and A captures the transmissibility, okay? So using this product, using this formula, we can randomly generate a simulated network out of say 100 nodes, okay? So here, uh, the nodes, each node's social activity levels are also randomly generated. 
And in this picture, the red node here is the source node. This is where the disease starts. This is the first person who got infected. The blue nodes, right? The, the three blue nodes on this picture, the blue nodes represents people who are infected. Right? So they are connected to the red nodes through some arcs that were randomly generated. You also see some arcs uh, that are represented by those dashed lines or dotted lines. So those were also randomly generated arcs, but they were not connected to the source. So they were just hypothetical arcs. In this picture, only three people got infected. But what, what about this one? Many more people got infected, right? So you'll see many more blue dots, okay? We can generate, say, like a thousand networks such as these and see how many times during these 1,000 trials, a particular node turns blue. Right? So that gives us a chance that a node with a certain social activity level being infected. Okay, So uh, overall, like for example, in this picture, only a few people got infected. But, but and, and this one, only one got infected, and the disease died out. Right, But not in this one, right, and, or, or this one. But overall, in our analysis, we can use math formulas instead of just simulation to calculate the infections, uh, infection probability. And here is a graph, OK? So on this graph, the x-axis is the social activity level, and the y-axis is the chance of being infected, right? so in, in a large network. As we can see, the probability of infection is not linear in, is not linear in the social activity level. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, it's intuitive that the higher the social activity level, the higher the chance a node is infected. And that insight is, is, is going to be important too. Uh, by the way, this network, this network model does not only capture human disease. It can model uh, any other kinds of infection, including computer barrels infecting a computer ne network, or even the spread of rumors. Okay, And this is the beauty of math. And that, that's why I'm drawing to using math to analyze social problems. So this is just a, a, a network model of, for infection. And there's no in, in, intervention or information design yet. So now let's talk about potential intervention that people can take. We know that inf interventions may include a collection of, of activities from wearing masks, uh, washing hands, social distancing, to uh, taking vaccine shots. Some of these uh, interventions are more effective than others, but none of them are completely free. For simplicity, let's just consider one intervention with an associated cost. Okay? Uh, the benefit of this costly intervention is to, protect, to pr provide protection. If a node I takes the intervention, its chance of being infected is reduced. And the chance of infection from other nodes who may be connected to, to node I is also reduced. The question is, is everybody willing to take the intervention? Well, that depends on the comparison between the cost of taking the intervention with the expected cost of being infected. Right? So on the left-hand side, you see the cost of the inter intervention that you know. On the right-hand side is the calculation between the cost of infection. For example, if I know that that uh, infection makes me really sick, then I know that this cost of in uh, infection is pretty high. And then if I know that the probability of infection is, is high, um, that also may trigger me to, to take the costly intervention. Now, uh, let's think about these quantities. Okay, What is my chance of being infected? That certainly depends on my own social activity level. It also depends on the behavior of other people, if you think about it. right? So if, if everyone else takes the, the protection, that would block transmission routes around me then I may prefer to free ride instead of bearing the cost of taking the intervention. So this is a game between all the players. All right. Of course, I'm not talking about any kinds of game or the Olympic games here. Right? So most of you probably know that game theory is a branch of applied mathematics that forms a foundation of modern economic theory. In a rational world, the production rate is not 100% in this game, but rather an equilibrium outcome of this game. So in our specific model, people with higher social activity levels would choose to, to take the intervention. And with lower ones, may not, right? just because there are different chances of being infected. 
So in our model, there's a threshold of social activity levels that we call the equilibrium threshold. Okay. So with this, this setup, the information design part finally comes in. Remember that for an individual node to decide whether to take the intervention, it needs to calculate this trade-off. Okay. Um, the problem is, as individuals, we do not know the exact values of some of the quantities in this decision. Following this slide, for example, let's assume that we are not sure how severe the infection could be. So, say in the beginning of a, an epidemic, we may not know how sick I can get if I'm infected. Is it really bad, like making me really sick, or um, not too bad, like a bad cold or a flu? In comparison, healthcare professionals know better because they have more data and, and, and information in advance. So should the information sender pass on the exact information? Well, that's a decision, which depends on the decision maker's objective. So what would be a good objective for an information sender who cares about the community? Let's assume that the information, the, the objective is to minimize the total cost of all members in this community. That includes the cost of getting sick as well as the cost of taking interventions. Given this objective, how should the information center convey information? Here, let's actually compare between two simple information design strategies. Okay, shown on the slide, is, is, is the first strategy, which is to say nothing. So in other words, the, the information designer, uh, the, the information designer knows uh, what's, what, will, what is going on, but promised to say nothing in the beginning and did say nothing, okay? So in that case, the equilibrium threshold is the same as the one we saw before. So this bar looks exactly the same as we saw before, right? So, so above the, the, the threshold, people in, uh, would take intervention, below not, okay? That's one strategy, okay? Um, the other strategy is to tell the whole truth. When the sender knows whether it's really bad or not too bad. So in other words, we just take it simple, take it easy, and only consider two possible states of the world, really bad or not too bad. Okay? If we know that the infection cost is really bad, then more people choose to protect. Right? So the equilibrium threshold gets deeper down here. Okay? On, the, on the flip side, if it turns out to be not too bad, then um, the equilibrium threshold is up here, right? So fewer people take protection. So is it better or worse from the point of view of minimizing the total society cost up front before we even know the, uh, the, the true state of the world? For the information sender to follow the first strategy of saying nothing or the second strategy of telling the whole truth? It's actually not clear. Okay, under the first strategy of saying nothing, the intervention threshold is somewhere in between the two thresholds under the second strategy of telling the whole truth. The trade-off depends on where these thresholds are and the initial probabilities of these two, uh, two states of the world. And the issue is that the model has many nonlinear components. For example, as we saw in an earlier slide, the chance of infection is a nonlinear function of the social activity level. Nonlinearalities such as these imply that under some model parameters, it is actually better to say nothing than telling the whole truth. So if it is better upfront for the information center to use the first strategy of saying nothing, but then it turns out that the infection cost is actually really bad, would the sender want to break the initial promise and the review of this information, right? So more people can, can choose to protect if being told is really bad, right? The problem is revealing only when it becomes really bad implies that not revealing must mean that it's not too bad. So effectively, you're turning to the second strategy then. So a sender with commitment power would actually announce a strategy up front and really stick to it. Right. Committing to a pre-announced strategy is what we really meant by telling the truth here. So you tell the truth of what you will do, and then you do 
what you promised. Even if the promise is, I'm not going to tell you anything. Because that may be better for the society. Along the same vein, even if the information center prefers more people to take the intervention, the center cannot always say it's really bad no matter what. Because always saying really bad is like the, the boy who cries wolf. People will eventually become indifferent and ignore the message. That's why lies do not survive in the long run facing rational information receivers. More generally, information design can go beyond these two strategies of saying nothing or telling the whole truth. The information center can always commit, uh, can, can, can also commit to sending a somewhat vague message. So this can be done by pre-committing to announcing some behavioral guidance directly. For example, um, as an information center, I do not directly tell you really bad or not too bad. Right? Instead, I tell the public what to do. For example, I, I, can, I can say people with certain social activity levels should take the intervention. And the announced levels depend on the true state of the world. And I tell you upfront uh, about that. Right? The design needs to make sure that rational information receivers do follow those behavioral guidelines. And once again, this is not telling the whole truth, but more than saying nothing. Okay? Uh, in fact, we can model general information design problems as an optimization model that minimizes the total expected social cost um, under the constraint that people are willing to follow the recommendation because they know that you're telling the truth, even if not the whole truth. Based on this model, we can also answer some, some other interesting questions. Uh, for example, should a society accept uh, being told, being, uh, not being told the whole truth? Right? In other words, under a political system where government policies reflect the will of the people, or at least the majority of the people, is it possible that people think that it is okay or even preferable to be given noisy information? Well, if we just look at the two strategies uh, presented on this slide, some people actually benefit from the society not knowing the whole truth. This is because saying nothing induces more people to take the intervention in the state when things were not too bad. So the additional intervention cost is borne by some people while everyone actually in the society benefits. Exactly who is better off and how many people are maybe better off can be evaluated by the model. So our model allows us to quantify and address questions such as whether the majority of the society, the society may prefer uh, to not being told the whole truth. And, and finally, I want to mention that information design is actually a fairly hot academic research area uh, because its applications goes well beyond controlling infection. Think about online businesses, okay? So many of them provide some sort of customer review for different products, like between one and five, right? So many companies show uh, the average value of their customer reviews. Some also show how many customers uh, uh, provide the reviews, right? So this average value is a truth, but not the whole truth, right? The whole truth would also include exact valuation for each reviewer over time, as well as written comments, as well as number of customers who were given the chance but not providing a review as well as many other information that may be remotely related. Right? Clearly, all, all online businesses choose to do some sort of information design, um, either consciously or not. OK, with that, let me finish my presentation. Um, I, will, I welcome questions from the audience. All right, so, uh, so here's a question. How do you tell a partial truth or noisy truth? Well, that's, that's a good question, right? So I did not spend too much time elaborating on exactly how to convey partial information just now, right? So, so generally speaking, a truth but not whole truth may look like something like the following, okay? So I can say, uh, if it is really bad, with 70% chance, I will ask people with social activity levels above 0.2 to protect. And then with 30% chance, I'll ask people uh, with level about 0.4 to protect. And if it's not too bad, right? So remember the two states, too bad, really bad or not too bad. If it's not too bad, I'll ask uh, the, the 0.2 threshold, uh, 0.2 and above to protect 
with 40% chance, and poem four and up protect with 60% chance. Right, so this is a bit of a mouthful, but but um, know that I'm not saying whether it's really bad or not too bad. So I'm not lying, right? So I'm I'm, I'm conveying some information. I'm just promising uh, that what to tell people, right? So upfront, I'm I'm promising people that I'm going to say something like that. Okay, and then after you hear from me, right? When I say anyone with a uh, uh, point two or above should protect, you have a sense that it's more likely to be really bad. But you're not absolutely sure, because uh, it can also be not too bad with some chance. Right? So this is a way of convey, uh, conveying partial truth. And the optimization model can help us to determine those social activity levels um, and those probabilities. OK, so that's, um, that's, that's, that's that. Um, right, uh, let me see if there's any other questions. So some general comments, okay? So um, when we think about rational uh, uh, decision making, is sometimes it's, it's it's kind of interesting and and, and intuitive. So mathematical models like this can can often gives gives us deeper insights into uh, what is going on and and uh, how, how to deal with situation, okay? Um, so 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 that's the uh, that's the general sense of of. Conducting this kind of work um, to to uh, to have a better understanding of of, uh, of um, the the nature of the world. Yep. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Uh, that's right. So there's a there's a question regarding uh, the behavioral study uh, of of um, uh, of disease c uh, control. That's an important uh, aspect as well. And some of our colleagues uh, at Fuqua actually uh, work on that as well, right? So so as a mathematical modeler, I focus on rational decision making, and that's why um, this is my focus. But that's not to to say that this is all. This is the whole story. In fact, this is such a complex problem that uh, that cries for all kinds of inputs and and uh, and, and research and investigation. Okay. All right. So, so there's another uh, question uh, from David. In a scenario where uh, you tell a partial truth, it may benefit the society as a whole. But does it mean that some members may bear the cost with no benefit, while others gain benefit without additional cost? That is actually exactly right. Okay. So, so the the general societal policy is almost always like that. Right, so I, my understanding—I mean, I'm, I'm not a political scientist—but my understanding of politics is basically about trade-offs and, and compromise and and uh, um, uh, and uh, in negotiations that uh, share the burden of the whole society and, and see which uh, uh, who benefits and who pays and and in in certain uh, different situations that things may be different. Okay, so a mathematical model like this can be used to analyze. Right, so tell to tell us the the uh, uh, the, the, the truth about uh, who benefits and uh, who, uh, who bears the cost. What would be the, the 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 final decision? Well, that depends on the um, the the will of the society. But um, analysis like this can help us gaining a, a better understanding, a more objective understanding of of issues like that. Okay, good question. All right. So um, thank you. So 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 we're we're uh, towards the, the the end of uh, this session. Thank you for joining joining me and joining us. Uh, remember to join us again on August eighteenth. Finance professor Manju Puri will be here discussing her recent research on paycheck protection program. All right. Bye bye.